Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 1, and this is session 23. Uh, it's actually going to be in the notes for 23 and 24. And because I don't have notes in front of me, it may also be for 25 and 26 and 27, maybe something in 28. So we'll see how all that goes. We also don't have the PowerPoint, so if you turn with me to Romans chapter 12, we're going to take a look over there, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to start out uh, looking at, um, well, let's just get ourselves on the uh, common frame of reference of where we are in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 was a godly thinking where Paul says, For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And, uh, that, and, and we understood what that measure of faith was. That's what produced verse 3. This is, this is more critical than you might imagine. Verse 3 is, what's, is what brings godly love into existence. And when I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about an emotional type love that you have for, you know, your children or your family or, or, or for someone you're close to. I'm talking about the kind of love in which you vow on purpose, you make a conscious decision to value and esteem something. That's terminology now that we've used for a long, long time. And so what you're learning now is how to value and esteem each other on the basis of the fact that we have all been dealt the same measure of faith. And we understood what that measure of faith was. The measure of faith was the responsibility, I'm going to just boil it in a nutshell, the responsibility to labor with our Father in the various offices in which that labor may be conducted. And we also understood from the next verses, not everyone is going to have the same office, but everybody is going to participate in that labor that the body is going to do. When you're running across the field to catch a ball, different members of your body are all doing different things, but they're all working commonly for the body to accomplish one thing, catch the ball. And so laboring with our Father is that one thing commonness that we all have, and we learn to, that this is where that comes, that's what I'm saying, the godly love, it's not like this is a magic wand where you look at the other people in the room and you go, well, you know what, now I just love Ron or, you know, or someone else. It's not that. It's where you now look at them and you say, I, I love them in that I value and esteem them as part of the body that without which this body would be handicapped and would not be able to function in the fullness that it is designed to do. Then, and so that's where that comes into existence, and that's what's supposed to happen when you clearly understand what the measure of faith is, and that loopy has been given the same measure of faith as Carson, who's got the same one as John, the same as Linda, the same as everybody in the room. Now we can look at each other and say, everybody's important, and we need our thinking to be in that direction. Then, verses 4 and 5... This is where we began to get those body attributes. And we identified the four body attributes. And what I want to make sure is that you have these down, and this is where I'll give you that last one. That first body attribute that we got out of that was that every member mu must participate. That means that no longer can a member sit on their hands and say, well, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, I'm using that thing out of the verses there, that you can say, well, you know what, because I'm not this, then I'm just, I don't have anything to do, and I'm not going to participate. Because if, if, if your normal body operated in that way, we'd never be able to get out of bed in the morning, let alone perform the tasks that we do. This group, and I'm talking about this group right here, made up of all the diverse members that we have, is going to have to learn to operate as a body. And that means as we fill the offices of an assembled group of people for the purpose of an education in godliness, not meeting together because we're a Boy Scout troop, but because of godly edifying, the first thing we have to do is we have to participate. The second thing we have to do is cooperate. And that means that our participation is not of the Lone Ranger type, 
where we're just going to do our own thing, and we have 15 people going off in 15 different directions. They're all participating, but not in unison. The body requires a cooperative participation. And those two became two sides of the same coin, and that's why we divided that section up into really two parts, especially when we took that over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you remember, and by the way, let me just look over there because I'm going to cite the verses here because we're going to, we're going to get back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And, um, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and that, would, that started, I think I started this in Originally in verse 12 and ran us down to verse, well, I'm in 2 Corinthians, so let me get to 1 Corinthians. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, started us in verse 12 and came down to verse uh, 16. Uh, yeah, 16. So that would be, okay. And, uh, and then we came to that next section in 1 Corinthians, which is also found in Romans 12, 4, and 5, and we found those next two body attributes, and that is that when we see a need with other members of the body, we serve the needs of that member, and that, and your body does that all the time. It's even doing that when you're asleep at night. Because one thing you've got to have is blood, and you've got to have oxygen, and your heart and lungs are working to serve the rest of the body, no matter what. And so that's the way we've got to be as well. And, and, and by the way, I'm not going to give us a list of how to do this. And why wouldn't I do that? Because now all of a sudden, we've set up another kind of law of this is what we have to do to be spiritual. And we can't get back into the tutor and governor business. So what we're going to have to do is, and you're going to have to, as an adult son, begin to look around and see the needs of other members in the body and, I, and, and, and start doing that on purpose. Why? But out of the godly love that was generated because you understand that this is a body, that every member is necessary. We've all been dealt the same measure of faith, which means the Father, no matter what office we occupy, is looking at us all equally. And when we really understand that, what we want is the success and full function of every other member. I mean, it doesn't talk, but my eyes want my feet working. And my, and my feet want my hands working. And they want my legs working and all of that. And so we serve, and here's the last one. Because really, the, the illustration that we found is when one member suffers, this is 1 Corinthians 12, when one member suffers, all members suffer with it. And when one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. And I thought, what is that one word that actually allows us to properly respond to whatever the situation is, whether it's a bad thing, suffering, or a good thing being honored. And I just said the word. That's exactly the way I wrote it in the notes. The word is this body now learns to respond to whatever is happening to the other members of the body. And that's a shade difference than just serving and looking for a need, but it's actually now responding in harmony in the appropriateness of whatever circumstance is going through. And so there's that fourth word. Now, on those flashcards that I handed out, do we still have more of those flashcards somewhere? Didn't we hide them somewhere in here, Loopy? Um, anyway, if you didn't get those, we've got some here. We left some here, and they may be in that cabinet. But if you got your flashcard, this last word, maybe some of these other words need to be replaced on there. Because really, I only took it to the attitude and not to the action. Because remember up here, we we're talking about use. And uh, yeah, this is them. So we have some of those. And these are, yeah, okay. So anyway, you're gonna, these are going to have to be, uh, two of these are going to have to be replaced. with. It. Tom didn't get one. So let me just hand one over there now. And uh, so if you didn't get one of these, there's, some, there, there's this one. And I'm, I had more to bring you. I printed up a bunch of them. And um, they're sitting in Imperial. So just come by after the study and I'll give it to you. Um, 
Okay, that just went right over your head, didn't it? Okay, so there's those four, there's those four body attributes that we got out of Romans 12, 4 and 5. Now, we're going to move into verses 6 through 8. And now let's read that, Romans chapter 12, and starting in verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to, unto us, rather prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, or uh, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness." Now, that takes us to the end of verse 8. Now, here's how he started out. You understand that what's being talked about here is gifts. In the previous verses, we got introduced to a word, and that is, all members have not the same office. And an office actually implies service, and uh, not just accountability, but the doing of something. And what you're going to find is... That in the days, now you have to follow this carefully because I'm not going to remember all of the scriptures to give you in the very order in which it was laid out. So just in my mind, I'm going to assemble it back together. But let me put a timeline up here for you. When he says in verse 6, and let me just read that again, having then gifts according to the grace that is given to us, and then he lists those gifts. Now, we're going to come back and look at those. You need to understand that there is a difference between the gifts that are mentioned and the office that is mentioned. The gifts here in verse 6, and this is the office here in uh, verse 4. And so there's a bit of a difference there, and I want to point out that difference. It is true that if a local assembly is actually going to bring themselves into existence as a body, they will begin to do that by the end of verse 8 as they labor, because this is the, this is the godly thinking, this is the godly living, and this is going to be the godly labor those are the three components of godliness that we find in this first feature of godly love, which was what? Selflessness. Uh, that man ought not to think of himself more highly. Everyone has that same measure of faith he does. Well, okay. Now, this godly labor, as we begin to take these four body attributes and put them into practice when this body is assembled together, we are actually going to be given the opportunity by filling the various offices within an assembly, the opportunity to labor with our Father in something He is doing. Now, is, are you going to be able to live out of these things and accomplish things that are not necessarily laboring with your Father? Of course you are. Of course. This is a way that we need to begin thinking about each other and interacting with each other. And it really does have to become that. If we don't get this, if we don't get this produced in us, we're not going anywhere with this. This is, this is the ground floor. This is the foundation. But once these things are, you know, we kind of get this in our mind and then we start integrating it into not just our thinking, but now in our actions toward one another and we start looking for those kinds of things, then we're going to be given a way very specifically in which we'll take those same things and now we'll labor with our Father for something He wants to do with an assembled group of believers. And that godly labor then uh, it, 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 that'll, that'll be the, the final, what am I saying, the final component of what he's trying to get accomplished with us. So now, here's what happens. By the way, you do understand that when this moves from, these body attributes move from data. Okay, I, I got the, the body attributes. When it moves from data into your living, that's, how effectual working will take place. There has to, it's not just, 
I know facts. Everybody with me here? Those facts have to actually influence our conduct and behavior. If it doesn't, then all you have is head knowledge. Well, that, I'm using the old terminology. We used to talk about somebody knowing the Lord, and we'd say, well, they have head knowledge that Jesus died. But have they ever really done anything with that? Well, I'm going to use that terminology just for the sake of simplicity and say, this can't be, you know, and I gave that illustration of my teacher and the math deal and wake me up in the middle of the night. It really has to go beyond that. It, it's not just, I've got the answer, but that answer is actually working in me that I'm using it. Okay, and by the way, you have to do that on purpose. That has to be a conscious decision to make that done. All right, now, in coming to the godly labor aspect of that, here's what you have to understand. I'm setting, I said all of that to set you up for this question. The only way that effectual working can take place is how. I'm not asking for you to repeat all of the process that I just told you, but, how, okay, and what is it you're called to believe? The Word. You are called to believe the Word, yes? In other words, it was the Word that told us not to think more highly than we ought to think. It was the Word that told you how to value and esteem like your Father does. That's what makes it godly love, because the way He views this assembly is not um, I, I like uh, 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 Lee a whole lot, but James, not so much. Your father doesn't look at it like that. He looks at it and says, I dealt the same measure of faith to Lee that I've dealt to James and vice versa. And I look at them both as integral, critical parts of a body if it's going to proper, properly function. We have to start doing that. So we value and esteem each other on the basis of that. And because all of that gets done on purpose, we be, but we only did that because the Word told us about thinking that way. The Word told us about the measure of faith. The Word is what led us to understand about participating and cooperating and serving and responding. It was the Word that did that, yes? So let me ask you, here's the setup. How big of a jam would you be in if you didn't have the Word? You wouldn't know anything about it. And there's my point. Because here on the timeline, as Paul writes his letter to the Romans, the Word of God has not yet been completed. But this whole thing, which is, as Paul writes to Timothy, godly edifying. That's the name for it. Edif and Edifying is being built up unto godliness, and you've got the three components to godliness, thinking, living, and labor. That's godly edifying. By the way, that is the only legitimate reason for a local assembly to exist. Look, I know there's a million good things. Godly edifying is the thing. Now, someone would hear that, and they would accuse me of saying, you've taken something in the Bible, and you've carried it to an extreme. But I'm going to tell you that without being edified unto godliness, you haven't achieved anything. So, however you want to categorize that, that is the main goal. And nothing else substitutes for it. Nothing else will do the job that edifying is supposed to do. There is no replacement. All right, now having said that, in the book of Romans, there is no completed revelation of Scripture. There's nothing now for them to do. But does God want those saints at the beginning? Because let's back this up just a little bit, and let's start right here. Here's the conversion of Paul, which is now the beginning of the dispensation of Gentile grace. And he's revealed the mystery of Christ. Paul is now preaching the gospel of the grace of God. As he's traveling, he does have a to the Jew first ministry, and he goes into the synagogues, and with the signs and wonders of an apostle that Israel would be looking for to substantiate the message, he preaches the message that God in his dealings with Israel in a favored nation status has come to a close. 
Peter has gotten a very confusing message from the Lord about this sheet with all these unclean animals, rise, Peter, kill and eat, which then is followed by a command to follow these guys to a Gentile's house, Cornelius. And when Peter gets there, he, people say, well, Peter was going there to carry the gospel. Peter had no idea why he was going there. Read the account. When he gets over there, the first thing out of his mouth is, normally you know that it's not lawful for me, a Jew, to come in and be with you, a Gentile. But God told me to do it. So, why am I here? It doesn't look like he's on an evangelistic crusade to me. So with that in mind, you've got Paul coming along now, Peter, and what you have is going on in this, in this period here is you have a, because the God's specific, and, and people balk at this. I use this word program. It's just a word that sums up God's prophetic dealings with the nation of Israel. So let me make that clear. What really, what really bothers me about that is, is I, I don't mind the question, but what bothers me about that is when someone doesn't like the doctrine, they want to focus on an element to discredit the whole doctrine. And so what they say is, well, the Bible doesn't use the word program. Okay, call it whatever you want. God has a prophetic, it is a program, I don't care, but he has a prophetic, if I say scheme, you'll say scheme's not in the Bible. Uh, God has laid out prophecy for Israel, yes? yes? And he has laid that out on a timeline of events that he revealed first in Leviticus 26. He added detail and furthered it in the book of Daniel chapter 9. How we're biblical enough for everybody so far. There's nobody in this room, but I'm just saying. And, and so I look at this whole thing that God has laid out from beginning to end, and to me, it appears to be a program. And if you look, or a plan, but then those, or an agenda. But see, they'll say, well, those words aren't in the Bible either. Well, neither is the word Bible, but you keep using it. I mean, that, you know what? They'll call when the Lord returns the rapture. It's not in there. I understand what it is. It's a word that encapsulates a doctrine of the catching away of believers that ends the dispensation of grace. I get that. So if you don't want to give me the latitude to do what everybody does in their common speech, I'll guarantee you when people talk about Bible doctrine, they never adhere to only Bible words when they're describing it to someone. But they want to bring that out for me because they don't like the doctrine. If you don't like the doctrine, just be man enough to say, I don't like the doctrine and it bugs me that I can't refute it in my Bible, so I'm just going to pick on one little area here to discredit you. Just be up front about it. All right, I'm sorry, I got all carried away on that, didn't I? Okay, all right, good mic is back. Okay, schizo, here we go. <clears throat> sorry, it's just exasp... Oh, now I'm going to get back on it. Okay, here we go. So here's what you have. You have, from the time of Paul now, you have this diminishing, and this is it. And by the way, that's a Bible word that Paul uses to describe exactly what's going on with his <clears throat> program, with Israel, because now that is, a, there's a diminishing going on while, remember those Gentiles who were strangers from the covenants of promise and without God and without hope in the world are now, guess what? God is now with them. Hey, look, <clears throat> can I just show you something? This is great, Acts 15. Now, this would have been in your notes if I had remembered to pick up the bag and put it in the car and bring your notes. You would have seen this. But I'm, so it's kind of out of order. But Acts chapter 15, this is a great place to look at it. In Acts chapter 15, look with me in verse... <coughs> Uh, I'm going to put my eyes on it here in just a second. James is going to come along and say, uh, after Paul, Paul and Barnes, okay, look, here's the deal. Paul and Barnes are up in Antioch. Judaizers come from Jerusalem, and they see Gentiles being saved, and they say, don't you know you have to be circumcised to be saved? And if you're not, then you're not saved. And Paul is saying, that's a bunch of hogwash. There is not any work that you're going to do to be saved. 
And uh, so there's a controversy. And because these guys are from Jerusalem, there is a aura of prestige applied to them. And so the people say to Paul, you need to go to <coughs> Jerusalem and consult with the apostles and let's get, let's get the truth sorted out. Oh, that just drives me nuts. Since when did a committee ever come to the truth? That's how you're going to determine truth? See, and so Paul doesn't want to go. But then the Lord, by revelation, tells Paul, go to Jerusalem, and here's what you're going to say to those guys. And so when Paul gives his separate accounts of this, not only as Luke records it here in the book of Acts, but as Paul writes about in the book of Galatians, those that seem to be somewhat mattered nothing to me, just because they were apostles during the time of Israel's something other than program, Paul says, doesn't mean a thing in the mystery of Christ. But anyway, when he gets over there, he begins to talk. And now we'll take that up here in Acts chapter 15, because there's a whole group assembled there. And then, uh, <clears throat> let's see, and it says, because um, they, did, they did come down, and now I want to pick this up where it says, and they all kept quiet and listened to Paul. And it's right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Miracles and wonders that they, Paul and Barnabas had wrought, not just in front of Israel, but also now among the Gentiles. Now this is pertinent to our study in Romans 12. And after they had held their peace, James, who was the leader of the group in Jerusalem, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. I love that wording. That wording is perfect. I love that. Because as you know, with the beginning of the dispensation of grace and Paul coming on through at the end of the dispensation of grace, which actually ends with that event that we call the rapture that the Bible refers to as the blessed hope. When you get to the end of that, what's going to happen? What's going to happen on the timeline? When God has, when, when all of the dispensation of grace has run its course and the body of Christ has now been caught away, it res that's right, Israel's... <sighs> God starts working with Israel again. How about that? Wow. And would anybody take anything different if I said their program started back up? Only... Only semantics will find that. Okay, so Israel's program begins again. So what does James say here when he quotes Simeon? God had, because where was God before on the timeline? Working with the nation of Israel, yes? God hath visited the Gentiles. Do you know when you go for a visit, do you know what that means? You're just there, for, you're not there permanently, you're just there for a while because eventually you're going to do what? You're going to, you're going to go home, right? You're going to go back home, you're visiting. And so, you know what God's, you know, so this is great terminology. He was with Israel, then James says, now he's visiting the Gentiles, because sooner or later, guess what he's going to do? He's going to go back and resume and bring to a completion the prophetic scriptures which comprise a program for Israel and for his plan and purpose with them. So I like that word visiting. I thought that's a great way to look at that. All right, but now uh, back to Romans chapter 12 back to Romans chapter 12. And so <clears throat> this, this issue now that you have Paul and he is writing to the church at Rome, 
But is God interested in the saints at Rome being edified? Yes or no? Yes, He is. How about the saints in Corinth? Is He interested in them being edified? There is a way that they can be edified, and that is without any written Scripture. And that is for Paul to personally show up and teach them that which was given to him. They, could they be edified through that? Yes, they could. But was, could Paul be in more than one place at a time? No, he couldn't. And what God needs, and by the way, since there is no internet, since Al Gore had not yet invented the internet in Paul's day, we find that God has made a supernatural uh, means of edifying the saints. And he did that through the gifts. And the reason that Paul mentions the gifts in verse 6 is because the gifts were in operation. Now, I'm going to submit something else to you. Those of you that are in Tommy's class on Sunday, you may know these by heart, and I can't remember them exactly. I mean, I've, I've taught them a, a dozen times, but um, there are three times in the book of Acts that as Paul is going to the Jew first, and they reject that message that he says, Lo, I turn to the Gentiles, or he makes a similar type statement. The last one is in Acts 28. And uh, does anybody, Francis, do you happen to recall where the other two are? It's like Acts 12, is it? Uh, does anybody in that class recall for sure? But you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> Paul makes three declarations. Oh, I want, uh, I, I'm going to get them wrong, so I'm not going to guess at them. But there are three times that Paul makes that declaration. Do you know what's interesting about that? He makes those three those three statements in three particular places. And if I'm not wrong, it's Antioch, and it's Corinth, and it's Rome, because those were the three outstanding areas of Jewish population following their dispersion. And, when, and, and so in these three areas where the major groups of the Jews are gathered, <coughs> that's where Paul makes the statement, I'm going to turn to the Gentiles, and they're going to receive it. And he makes that kind of statement. So three times he does that in those three areas. So that word is likely, see, to be in those three major Jewish population areas. Were there Jews in other areas of the world? Well, of course there were. But those seem to be the centers of population that were outside of Jerusalem. That's the point that I'm trying to make there. Okay, so what God has done for the edifying of the saints when there was no word to tell them the very things that we've been looking at as we go through the word is God had to be able to do that with some supernatural gifts. And the way he did that, and in fact we're going to look at those gifts, the way he did that is he assigned various offices. And when he did that, let me just give you a, a sample of this. One of those in the New Testament, not talking about the apostles of Christ like Peter and James and John, but there are apostles and there are prophets at the beginning of the New Testament. And let me tell you what their job was. Their job was, to, the apostles' job, was to be able to look at things that were written. Paul wrote, we understand there are 13 letters that Paul wrote that are in the New Testament as part of the canon of Scripture. But Paul wrote more than 13 letters. He actually refers in those letters to other letters he wrote that are not in the canon of Scripture. And what we understand from that is they were not intended to be part of the canon of Scripture. Can Paul write a letter and it not show up in the Bible? Well, sure he can, and in fact he did. But let me ask you a question. Can someone else write a letter? Someone else did write a letter, and they even pretended it was from Paul, and they sent it to the Thessalonians, telling the Thessalonians that the, that the, the rapture, the rapture, the blessed hope had already come and gone. They had missed it, and the tribulations they were enduring, which were really from the satanic policy of evil against them, 
he told, uh, th that letter said, those were the tribulations of the Lord's day of wrath, and they weren't, weren't gone at all. And that's why Paul said, don't, don't be affected by a letter as from us about this issue. He says, you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord can't come until these things happen. And he begins to detail those things. And, and then he says, remember when I was with you, I told you these things? And so he's straightening that. So there's a lot of false letters. There's some genuine letters, but they were never intended to be Scripture. And then there are letters that absolutely needed to be in the canon of Scripture. And guess what? It was these guys that determined what was Scripture and what wasn't. And the only way they could do that, because did they have a word by which they could test the letters? That's the whole idea. They did, there was no completed word by which to test it. The only way they could know is by a supernatural gift from God. So you have apostles, prophets, teachers. I'm going to stop there because that's actually the first three that comprise a set that have to do with one of the major operations of God. Now, what do I got left here? Just a few minutes. So <clears throat> if you've got that in mind, let me erase this real quick because I'm going to need this board. As we get ready now, I need us, in order to understand what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, is to understand what he's saying about the spiritual gifts. Because if you don't understand about the spiritual... See, if Paul's writing to the Romans who don't have a completed revelation of Scripture but are being edified by the spiritual gifts, you need to know how that dovetails for a group of people who do possess a completed revelation of Scripture. You need to understand how that translates into that. Because what Paul is going to tell you is... Now, hold your place there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12... We'll come back to Romans in a moment. But remember, Corinthians is kind of that answers in the back of the book type issue that if you don't get it in Romans, the Corinthians didn't get it. And Paul comes along and gives them great detail to solve all that out. So when you get into Romans chapter 12, look at verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And when you see that phrase, what do you, uh, that ought to set an alarm off in your head. What does that tell you? Okay, they are ignorant. He wants you to know, but there's one more issue to that. When he says, there are, I, I say there are seven, six times, six times Paul uses a, about essentially saying in words just like that, I would not have you ignorant or don't be ignorant of. And then six times he introduces a subject. I say that there's seven just because I'm including the one where Paul says, when he talks about Satan's devices, he says, for we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And the reason I include it is because most people are. So I'm thinking you need to know that one too. When you see those words about I would not have you ignorant or don't be ignorant, you know that is one of the favorite doctrinal targets of the adversary to cause corruption and confusion and to get the body of Christ off track doctrinally. It's a pet doctrine of Satan. And that's one he's focused on. And that's the reason that Paul brings it up that way. Because, listen to this carefully, if you are ignorant of any of those issues, it's not a matter that you're at greater risk of being overcome by the adversary. You will be overcome by the adversary. And I say that not because I like saying it, but because it's true. If you don't understand these doctrines, you will be overcome by the corruptive doctrine of the adversary. There's no two ways about it. And you know what that makes that very dangerous? Is that there is no test that you can apply to it to know the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. 
The only thing you have that will tell you the difference is contained in this book. You're not going to be able to feel the difference. You're not going to be able to look at it and perceive the difference. You're not going to be able to listen to it and know the difference. And you're not going to be able to form a committee and figure out the difference. You're going to have to have your father tell you the difference. Now, that's how critical these doctrines are. Now, to get to that, so Romans, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 starts off with, I would not have you ignorant of spiritual gifts, which means this is a hot topic for the adversary. Now, here's the last thing I'll tell you in this, in this session before we take our break. <clears throat> All of the spiritual gifts, and the Corinthians had those gifts, and do you know why they had those gifts? You should, because it was through the gifts that the edifying of the saints got accomplished. There was, look, no other way for that to get that done. If God did it supernaturally, remember when I had those a while ago and I said there were apostles, prophets, and teachers? If you had the supernatural gift to teach, you didn't have to do what I do all week long. You didn't have to sit in an office and dig it out of the dirt. You know, what, you, you know what? God gave you the supernatural gift to do it. So you would just show up, and guess what? You would have the ability to teach. Now, I know what you're thinking. We know you don't have the supernatural ability. We've heard you teach. I get it. But I have to tell you, that teaching, and we're going to see this in the Scripture all of the, these things, and by the way, we're going to look at all those gifts and we're going to talk about what they were. There's something in particular about all of these gifts because when a guy stood up and taught, the Bible says it was in part. In other words, he didn't know everything. What he did teach, that was true, but he only had a slice of it. So you know what, if, if we were knowing that, you know what we would do? If there was a guy in Glen Rose that had a slice of it, we'd go over and we'd listen to that guy teach, and we'd learn that. And then you might hear, hey, you know what, in Fort Worth there's a guy, he's got another slice. He's teaching something on a different area, and you know what, you'd go over and you, and you know what, now, now you got two slices. You know what that would produce? You'd be wanting to go everywhere and get as many slices as you could, right? So God says, those things are in part. By the way, they are wonderful. They are. But those spiritual gifts did not happen in and of themselves. God had a specific operation under a specific administration in which all of the gifts functioned. And to show you that, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and look with me in verse 4. And he's going to give you these three and then the rest of the chapter in verses 4 and 5. In fact, let me just list gifts up here so I can get them up here where I can put something off to the side of each one of these and we'll do it like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look with me in verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And then look in the next verse 5. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. Verse 6. And there are diversities of operations. Do you see that? Of operations. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And what you're going to find now in the rest of the chapter is here, starting with verse 8 and running through verse 11, it's going to talk about the gifts. And then in verses, and I got these out of order because I was putting them up this way, in verses 12 to 16, he's going to talk about the different administrations. And in verses 17 to, and let me just see how far this goes, um, Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. Uh, not, not 12 to 16, 12 to um, 26, not 16, 26, that's it. Remember when we covered those body attributes? That Remember, I wrote it right in the first time. It, it's, 
the administrations are covered in verses 12 to 26. That's the second division of that, of that uh, passage. And then you get to verse 27 to 31. So there you are. And that talks about the various operations. So he's going to tell you, hey, those gifts are not given without purpose and direction behind them. What I'm saying is this, folks, as we close down, because i got 38 seconds, so stick with me. <laughs> I know you're fading fast. Those gifts were not so that God could say, hey, you want to see something neat? And they are not so, I'm going to give you something so you can go around and parade how great you are because you've already been told not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, no matter what you're in Romans 12, your gift. Yes? So don't do that. You know what these things, were? these all have an operation. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go through and I'm going to, I'm going to put all of those gifts... We're going to take the gifts that are listed and we're going to lump them together under five operations. I'm going to show you five of them. And these gifts were meant to, when I say a certain operation, it is the gift was meant to accomplish something in its labor with the Father. This is the godly labor part of edifying. Are you with me? Remember where we are in Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, the godly labor. Verse 3, the godly thinking. 4 and 5, the godly living. 6 through 8, the godly labor. And so in, in, in the context of that, the gifts are given that God is laboring to do something with these gifts. In other words, they have a purpose behind them. They're, the Corinthians lost sight of that, and they thought it was just neat to have them. And because of that, Paul rebukes them very sternly as Children that couldn't st stand strong meat. They were carnal. There was divisions among them. They were operating like anything but a body. And he says, and now you're going to understand that these gifts that were given to you, that you might profit with all, were actually given with an operation in mind. And let me tell you something. If you don't know what their operation is, you will be overcome by the counterfeit. I'm just saying. Because Paul said, if you, if, you ha if, if you were back at the beginning of the dispensation of grace and you received that gift and you didn't know its proper operation, here's how vulner vulnerable you'd be. And I'm going to say this and end the session. There was a guy who came in to the group in Corinth who was actually exercising one of those spiritual gifts, teaching that Jesus was not the Son of God. And it began to have an impact on the Corinthians. And the gifts that should have served to warn them about that, not being properly utilized, allowed the adversary to get the upper hand on them. Now, I'm just going to tell you, he, he's counting on the fact that you're going to stonewall this. Do not do that. This is the truth of the Scripture. Now, I said that was going to be the last thing I'm going to say, and it's not. This is. We do not look at the Scripture the way your Heavenly Father does. To Him, it is not just the good book. To Him, it is not just, well, we love the Bible, but we're going to use the Bible to get it to say what we want it to say. Listen, it is magnified above His name. And you know what that means? It, when you read it in this book, you might as well take it for this. The Heavenly Father took on a physical form and stood right in front of you and spoke with an audible voice. Do you know what Peter said about that? He said, we were eyewitnesses of the things that he did in his ministry and of his death, burial, and resurrection, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. The written word trumps our eyewitness account. Do you know why? People have been fooled. There's something surer than that. And when your father looks at this book, he looks at it way different than most believers do. He says, that book is an extension of me. So, this is not... And by the way, we're not going to interpret a verse. We're going to look at those verses. We're going to take them just how they land. And what I want, if we don't see this, folks, 
we're not going to be able to understand then how to move those principles into what Paul is trying to teach us to operate as an assembly in Romans 12, 6 through 8. Our godly labor, it won't happen. This is the critical background to this, okay?